So hi everybody and welcome to the final session of this symposium on 3D visualisation in cultural heritage. Um, my name's Ellie King, I'm a PhD student at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History and at the University of Warwick and I am chairing this panel discussion today on the future of 3D visualisation in cultural heritage. Um, so just a bit, a bit of a recap, over the past two afternoons, we have had um, heard from a wealth of speakers on a range of topics from X-ray CT imaging at the British Museum to biomechanical models of early dinosaurs, which absolutely blew my mind, <laughs> um, to a practitioner's perspective of 3D digital heritage. So in this panel session, we have the three keynote speakers from the previous sessions coming together to take questions and to discuss the key themes of the symposium. Therefore, I'd like to welcome back Professor Daniela Petrelli from the Sheffield Hallam University, Dr Imran, Imran Rahman from the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and Thomas Flynn from Sketchpad for our final session. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank Hello. you for joining us. Um, so if you have any questions for our panel, please pop them in the chat. So I'm going to kick off with a question to get us started. Um, very relevant, of course. Um, so since the COVID pandemic has hit, how has it affected your thinking and practice in relation to your work beyond seeing the post-COVID world as an opportunity to engage in more 3D visualisation? So, Daniela, shall we start with you? Thank you. Yes. So everyone else probably is very happy of the COVID situation. For me, the COVID meant that uh, uh, Nearly all my projects have been paused. Uh, colleagues uh, at the Heritage Institution have been for long. And so I, at the moment I'm working on an app for an outdoor heritage, the only thing that you, you can do. And I've seen really a massive turn toward digital, uh, intended mostly online. Uh, some panic in certain organizations where they didn't have any digital policy. So now they are planning to establish a a digital presence, uh, mostly looking for interactive educational games or, or homeschooling. And uh, well, from one side, this could be very, very positive because uh, there's been a, an awareness. Suddenly, uh, they, every institution became aware of the importance to have something digital and something online. But on the other side, I think there is a, the missing uh, a point that as soon as we are going to be allowed to get out, we will all crave some physical experience. We will all want to, to be there, feel it, share it with our friends and families rather than using a computer screen yet again on our own because you know, computers are generally intended for one person or two people. So my think is that we should take this opportunity, these times to start to imagine how we can combine the online experience and the online uh, on-site experience. And, uh, ways in which we can connect uh, the, the digital and the physical world and create truly personalized experiences. There is now technology mostly in the Internet of Things when you can uh, you know, start something at the museum and then continue online and what you've done online, then you can bring it back to the museum. There are certain there are already some mechanisms. You can have a, a membership, for example, and so there are a, a, a several different ways and things you can um, imagine as a way of continuing this dialogue between the visitors and the museum uh, in the two, you know, the two realms of, of the, the digital and the physical. Too often I see the two things completely separated. So there is an online presence that is generally managed by one department and there is the physical presence that's managed by another department. The two don't talk. While there is, in my view, a lot of opportunities to try to think, yes, we have a digital presence that can be consumed only online or digitally, but there is also an opportunity to take that um, on site. So, for example, they, uh, when I was giving yesterday my talk, there are snippets of the, the game that I, we use in the museum, but that is just a snippet. So an invitation for you to then to go and, and play the game in full. So, and then by playing the game, the game in full, you could uh, discover some Easter egg, and so you could go back to the place and, and discover other things. So, yeah, my point is let's try to see how we can combine the two things together as an opportunity. 
Thanks, Daniela. That's certainly a good perspective. Does Imran want to take uh, this uh, point now? Yeah, no, thanks very much. I mean, I think it's important to highlight in all of these discussions, as both Daniela and Ellie have already done, that this is overwhelmingly a negative thing. Um, COVID has had terrible impacts on people across the board, uh, not only loss of life, but also physical and mental health. Uh, and the impact varies very radically worldwide. So, you know, the experiences of people in the United Kingdom are going to be very different to experiences of people in Australia. Um, and even between different European countries or US states, people are going to have very different experiences. Um, so I suppose what I wanted to say then is just that my perspective is probably a kind of biased UA, UK centric one. Um, but in, from my perspective, I mean, there's been lots of issues in terms of uh, data collection in particular. So as Daniela already mentioned, the people have been furloughed, um, labs, facilities, collections closed, uh, obviously international travel no longer possible. And all that's contributed to, I think, not just for me, but for colleagues as well, making it rather difficult to kind of collect new data, uh, 3D data, for example. Um, but I, I suppose where the, the opportunities have arisen have been in ways of using existing data sets that we've already generated and collected. Um, and clearly, you know, personally, but also I think in the community, uh, a large, whether that's paleontology or cultural heritage more broadly, there's a strong desire to make their, these kinds of data available. Um, and there's clearly a big audience uh, for this and potentially a bigger audience now. Uh, I think uh, it was in Andy Jones's talk yesterday, he showed the uh, the views uh, at least for, or maybe views or downloads for their 3D models had rapidly risen um, as uh, associated with lockdown related to COVID. Um, so I think that there's obviously an audience for that material. And then I think that in terms of kinds of how we use these data, we can think about the best way of serving the community. Uh, so, you know, researchers, for example, struggling to access collections and equipment, um, these kinds of 3D data can potentially enable visit, virtual visits um, using digitized specimens. And OK, they're not going to ever be as good as the real thing, but they still can provide a lot of information for people uh, that wouldn't otherwise be available. Um, something that's quite interesting, and, and uh, Kate Burton mentioned it to me yesterday, was remote access to equipment. Um, so she said she'd been working remotely for a while and using the SEM in the Natural History Museum in London remotely to image specimens. And you could imagine that kind of pipeline. Obviously, you have to have some people on site, but that can enable access to equipment for researchers in different parts of the world. Um, and then in, in the teaching side of things, I think, the again, the, the main barriers are sort of reduced face-to-face -face teaching, um, fewer practical classes, no field trips. Uh, there are opportunities there for uh, help supporting these activities, uh, virtual dissections, virtual field trips. I've seen some interesting ones being developed. Um, and then, of course, I think, as we've talked about a lot in the conference, public engagement. So, so there are no or few visitors to many public spaces, at least in the UK at the moment. Um, but there's obviously uh, an expansion in digital activities at the same time. Um, so it's thinking about how we do this best in terms of making content available. Um, and it takes time and it takes expertise and it takes money often. Um, so it's not easy um, work to do. And I think, you know, there's some a point that Stephen Day made earlier that we don't necessarily want to rush to put out as much stuff as possible uh, at the expense of the quality of the the content we're generating and providing. So I think quality is always, at least to my mind, the, the first and the most important thing. And that's kind of been our approach uh, in, in the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, a smaller number of higher quality models. Fantastic, Imran. And over to you, Thomas. Um, yeah. From the work that we do at Sketchfab um, and the inbound inquiries that I've been getting, um, I'd say the beginning of um, the year saw an increase in, uh, particularly in cultural organizations, asking about what Sketchfab can do and what it can offer, uh, and often specifically uh, mentioning the pandemic as a reason for developing online uh, programs. Um, if I can find my tab. Um, there, there are some nice quotes from the organizations themselves um, on the Sketchfab blog. We, we run um, spotlights uh, articles uh, on various projects on Sketchfab. And um, just to grab a couple of snippets from uh, 
uh, a few of them. Um, the team working um, at the University of York um, under an archaeology project um, said regarding the future of digital technology and uh, archaeology and heritage, it's been shown how important it is to have access to 3D models for, three, uh, for teaching during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's echoed um, by the team at the University of Queensland um, Earth and Environmental Sciences teams. Um, COVID-19 meant, this is a quote, um, all hands on deck in supporting other lecturers to adapt to the new normal across the university. Um, things were put on hold, giving staff the opportunity to begin to develop digital resources to devise strategies for online only teaching. Um, uh, very conscious about making 3D more accessible, not only to students, but to other teachers across the globe. So there's that idea of um, 3D uh, or online digital programs developing during the pandemic. But um, as Daniela mentioned, I think that's something that doesn't go away, that the, the online audience remains. Uh, but when the time comes to invite people uh, on site, the same content can be used uh, in that way. Um, one specific um, or two specific cases I'm thinking of are um, the Cleveland Museum of Art um, uh, in the US and the uh, Royal Armory in Sweden uh, both host 3D models on Sketchfab, so they're available online for embed uh, and sharing that way, but they also uh, basically pipe that same 3D into their gallery spaces, uh, the Royal Armory using a touchscreen and at Cleveland, the Cleveland Museum of Art, they, uh, you can control the 3D using um, a Kinect body scanner. So as you move your body, you can engage with the 3D. So it, that, that idea of, of, of definitely uh, squeezing the most out of uh, what you can do with digital content. And this isn't just 3D, I think. Right now, I think everyone's looking to um, do the best they can with online content, whatever the medium. Um, and that's, that's true for 3D as well. Um, you want to be able to show people something, talk to them about it. There's um, an interesting thing I saw the other day was um, a paid online tour for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So you pay some money and uh, you get taken around the gallery space by um, an expert. Uh, and that made me think, well, there's you know opportunities around content. Even if you make the content itself available for free, so the 3D models, public domain, you give it away. There are ways um, to, um, uh, well, to commercialize uh, the staff and the, um, the expertise that organizations have. Um, I think you can have it both ways. You don't have to say, we're going to give everything away for free and not make any money. I think that's an important uh, thing to, to consider. And yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, in, in some ways, um, the opportunities or the way people are thinking about what you can do with online 3D content and communities, I think, has been uh, developing. Fantastic. Thank you. So just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Now, going from that kind of enthusiasm that we've talked about in the games that have been made this year, but with the problem of resources, both financially and personnel wise, how do we keep up that momentum um, of these changes. So, Imran, should we start with you? Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Apologies. it's, it's a big question, one. isn't it? I mean, it's obviously the answer to that question is employ people who can do this in their role, but that's not really very plausible, I think, as a solution in the short term, at least, um, particularly in, you know, the cultural heritage sector. So I think, you know, part of it is having an established uh, kind of pipeline by which we not only say for if you take a lecture for example you know what well, as part of planning a physical lecture there's lots of things that go on there's checklists that are followed um, and it's about kind of adapting those protocols i think to incorporate uh, online digital uh, versions of the events as well so these kinds of hybrid activities where we're still trying to deliver our programs in in the physical space um, when we're able to welcome back visitors, for example, to museums, but we're also trying to do the same thing virtually. So um, I can't see any, re I, mean, I think you can get technology set up such to do that. The, I can't see any reason why you can't deliver a lecture in a, in a lecture theater, but at the same time stream it live uh, to people all over the world. And I think that 
now as of the as sort of the learning we've gained from from this period of time where we've kind of overcome those technical barriers that made people think oh well, this is going to be really hard or it's going to take loads of time and money we've sort of addressed a lot of those issues so i think it's a shame if we were to then sort of put all that aside and think oh well we'll just go back to to what we were doing before so i think you know it's a large about kind of mentality really in terms of making sure that we kind of continue to to do this stuff and i think that people will appreciate the benefits of these digital experiences and we'll still get benefits as speak as a museum but we'll still have benefits of being able to do deliver them online um so it would be a, a real shame to just sort of stop doing all of that work um but it is it is challenging and um you know in the absence of a magic money tree uh, it's just a case of trying to optimize the time of staff um such that they can do the best they can without overloading them and any further comments from you, Thomas? Could you repeat the question? Um, just talking about um, combining the enthusiasm for um, the new online kind of trend through to COVID, but with the problems of resources um, for a lot of museums and heritage organisations, how to keep the momentum going with all those kind of problems? Have you seen anything similar in your work i mean i just i just say one thing and this is something that sketchfab as a platform we struggle with is uh we need to constantly remind people about things that have happened already and with that i mean in terms of features that have been added to the site how you do x or y and um you you don't necessarily have to always make something new you can repeat what you already have created or, or um, reintroduce people to it because the the way that a lot of social streams, social media works is, is that kind of stream that maybe this week somebody didn't see, but next week they will see. Um, so I think um, don't be afraid to re-share re things um, because sometimes we're surprised at Sketchfab when we post one thing that didn't get much traction one, one week, one month, and then another time it does because it's picked up by the, the right people. So yeah, I, th I don't think it needs to be new all the time. If you have something, uh, squeeze, squeeze it for all, all it's worth. No, that's definitely true. Something new doesn't mean necessarily mean something better. And Daniela, anything else? Yes, I was thinking that there is an opportunity to create a uh, thing um, that could be monetized. Um, you know, uh, uh, Thomas before it was talking about uh, you can have uh, a the fact that you give something away for free doesn't mean that you cannot make money out of that. So if you can imagine, you could have a museum in a box. Now you go to the, the museum shop and you buy, I don't know, toys or replicas or something of that. We could imagine those type of things to be augmented. And so you can buy it when you go on, on, in the shop, but you can also have it at home. And when it arrives at home, then you can do things with that. And that would make, uh, lectures online or, or relations with whoever is on the other side more interesting uh, i'm in design and one of the problems that we have we do a lot of uh, hands-on activities that cannot be replicated with a, a, a zoom lecture and that is going to be the same of course you can do it online uh, talking but being uh, in the same place and looking at this object and and asking, you know, observe i don't know that that leg that i and you can have then of course the, the um, online model can zoom in while the, the plastic, uh, you know, 3D printed representation doesn't, but is a, a physical connection. And, and there is a lot in the sense of touch and touch makes you participate is the, the only sense that is uh, interactive. You touch and you are touching in return. So having something physical that connects you to the museum and with digital content online makes makes the, the connection stronger and your interest uh, even stronger. If you, you know, you can think, you can always build up on these things. You can send the, the objects, uh, make the 3D printing, printed uh, replicas, and then whoever received it can decorate it. And then you can, uh, you know, share your decoration online. Uh, again, you, you, as I said before, try to think of creating positive loops where, where people get engaged continuously. There is generally a small proportion of people that are connected with a certain museum because they are very keen, but those people are very important. So try to keep that and expand that uh, you know, 
keen visitors and keen people con connected, I think is is uh, is vital for the future. You know, in, at this time, they could even donate to the museum just to make sure that they 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 stay open. And, and building these 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 strong connection is not uh, uh, is not easy, but it's not impossible. There are studies already on what makes people bond uh, with a certain cultural organization. So. We can try, it's an opportunity to try to think in different ways. Uh, what can we do to, to, to reinforce this connection, physically, digitally, and the two together? Yeah, so in, its, in a way, it's not necessarily about the technology, but more about the connections and the relationships that it builds, really. Um, we're going to move on to a question from Anna, and she um, asks, so who is or should be made responsible for the preservation and the access of these digital resources? And um, how does the kind of content preservation curation um, work on the digital side of things? So if we want to go to Thomas first. Yep, uh, happy to. This is a, a conversation that comes up a lot um, with the organizations I work with. Um, and also within the AAAF um, 3D community group that I co-chair. Uh, and also as a topic within the work of uh, the CS3DP group, the Community Standards for 3D Preservation, which is a primarily US-based group, um, looking at data preservation, uh, among other things like copyright and um, workflows. Um, essentially, I think it's up to whoever's making the data to, um, as best they can, uh, take care of that data. I, there are recommendations, um, I, you know, for example, like backing everything up on a RAID drive and also to um, magnetic tape and storing it off site. And I think that's available, that kind of thing is available to a lot of larger organizations, but uh, not so for um, a small group of people in a small museum, maybe even one person creating data and preserving it. It might have to be just on their hard drive or on their laptop. Maybe there's a version of it on Sketchfab. Maybe there's a version of it on um, uh, other websites. Um, and there are um, online solutions for storing data um, that are available, um, but it begins with whoever's creating the data, deciding what they're going to uh, keep hold of or what they're capable of um, you know, taking, taking care of. Um, and then making those connections to the, the groups that I mentioned, I think will, um, provide better answers than than I can. Ab and Imran, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a very interesting question, I think. And um, Thomas has already kind of got out a lot of the the points there. But I think you know the individual certainly has a responsibility in the first instance that they've created that data and they are therefore responsible for it. But it I, what and not to necessarily answer a question with a question, but I think the the other kind of question I always have with these discussions is who's actually you know who ultimately takes responsibility for that because if you've got your data let's say you've got a CT scan of something that might have been uh, a CT scan of a fossil from a particular museum carried out using a scanner in a different institution by a researcher who was funded by a certain organization and then published a paper in a particular journal. So then who takes ownership of that? I mean, and there's actually lots of competing demands over that. Um, so I guess I would say, again, as a sort of museum person that where possible, it's good if the institution that houses the physical specimen um, on which the model is based is able to take some ownership of that. And I think that requires a bit of a change in practice for a lot of um, museums um, to realize that their collections that they they look after are not just physical things they're also digital things increasingly and I'll give you an example in, in our museum in Oxford um, some of the fossils that we study these fossils uh, from a, a site called the Herefordshire Lagostata um, they're completely destroyed during their analysis so they're serially ground away to create three-dimensional computer models. And the only thing that remains of those fossils is then the digital um, model. Um, so that is that is the collection of that specimen. So, you know, the museum has, I think, a responsibility to look after this material. It's the type specimen um, for these these different taxa. So it, I think in some, in certainly in some cases, it's ideal if the if those kinds of institutions can take ownership. But I totally take Thomas's point that, you know, if you're in a small organization or if funding is restricted, there is a challenge to kind of house this information in perpetuity, right? I mean, we say 50 to 100 years, but actually we mean forever 
really, if we're talking about museum specimens. Um, and it's not always cheap. Um, I guess I would hope that costs of things like online storage might come down. Uh, Thomas already mentioned uh, tape storage, which is a relatively affordable solution in many cases um, that perhaps people aren't always aware of. So maybe part of the question or part of the solution is is sort of sharing knowledge on different ways of looking after these data, um, not only the sort of fancy bells and whistles ones, um, but also the kind of things like tape storage, which are, I think, cheaper and potentially uh, you know, more affordable for a lot of institutions. I think I will pour a bit of uh, of water under all these ent all over this enthusiasm. I have a past uh, in information science. I work in information science for about ten years before I moved to design. And uh, uh, digital curation uh, is something that is known uh, in in digital libraries. And if you talk with librarians, they've been told, "Oh, do microfilms; uh, those are going to last forever." And now, of course, you have to go to the library to be able to use the machine that is able to read the microfilm. And in my life, I've seen. Think about the video or just the support. You know, I'm old. I started with computers in, in uh, the mid 80s, and at that time they were the floppy disks. Uh, and and you know, I can probably mention 10 different um, storages that you can, um, that I've seen in my life, probably more than that. And none of those could be used today unless you go to a museum of technology where you can put your stuff in. Praying that they have a, the, the proper software to be able to read it. Uh, there was a very interesting uh, challenge a few years back. Uh, uh, talk, it was called digital archaeology. So people were given a device, uh, sorry, a, 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 a memory support with some, some stuff on, on it. And they had to be able to go back, try to understand what it was. So sometimes they arrived to the ASCII code. ASCII writing, ASCII code, to be able to understand what it was. So documentation would be vital. Uh, it is not only, uh, you know, the, the um, um, uh, Imran was talking about how many people could be involved in a certain project, but is, you know, what type of, uh, uh, did he use a scanner to use it, a, a, a photogrammetry, what machine, what was the resolution? Um, there are so many details that needs to be taken into account. And when you have your data, first of all, you have to hope that standard won't change. Otherwise, you know, that's one other issue. Is, is, is there an agreed standard respect to which everyone is converging? Because otherwise that is going to create other problems in the future. Th there is, you know, if you're interested, go there and read some, the, there are some books about the digital curation. I discovered there exists these things are refreshing. Yes, you 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 have everything on a on a uh, suppose a CD-ROM, and then you kept the device to be able to read the CD-ROM and, and and all the software to do it. But maybe the CD-ROM degrades, so you have this process of refreshing periodically, going and checking that your data is still there. So it, it's not just it, you know. And yes, there are online digital vaults where you can uh, download all your stuff. But what they guarantee is that your data is there. They don't guarantee that you're able to use it. So it's it's really a kind of form. But there is already some, uh, if you go and talk with digital librarians, they know uh, a lot of these already. So there is a lot of, that we can learn from what they've done in the past to make sure that these things are, are, are preserved for the future. And could be a mix of, you know, small institution, public institution, uh, some museum, uh, it could be the Museum of Technology, for example. There are interesting now trying to revive uh, uh, video games from, uh, from the, the 80s or even the 70s, or simulators, and, and so that you can re-experience what was there. So, you know, really there is plenty of knowledge already there, not applied to these specifically, but we can look back at what has been done and learned and, and use it for the future. Fantastic, thank you. Now I'm going to go to another question from someone in the audience, and this is about um, audiences. Um, so, is there any data or insights that you have about um, how audiences are, are um, responding to this tech, um, engaging with it? I know, Daniela, this is similar to the kind of work and stuff that you talked about yesterday. So, 
Should we start with you? How did audiences respond and react to to this kind of technology? Uh, it's quite a complicated thing because it depends on what you offer. Uh, you know, touch screens and mobile phones is already seen. So the per periodically they are declining. What is interesting is that a lot of museums are investing on apps or these online uh, or even tablet or, or representation in place, but very rarely there is an assessment. So everything finishes with the opening of the exhibition. Uh, there isn't a, you know, a long term uh, analysis, data collection analysis. Do people keep using it? Do they, do they use it to the end? Uh, there is also an issue, so for example, with apps, we don't know how many people actually uh, use it. I have some uh, anecdotal uh, evidence working with museums for a very long time. And some, so for example, some, the, the, a museum I use um, uh, the barcode from, uh, from the ticket at the entrance to activate certain things along the way. And then you could, from home, do something more with your, your ticket because that created your profile and so on. So 10% of the visitors used actually their ticket to activate content uh, through the exhibition. Uh, we have done some installation, bespoke installation, interactive and so on, and we reached the 40%, uh, 40 to 50% of visitors using it. And the, the museum were really amazed because not everyone is interested in the technology. They want to go there to see the museum. Uh, and then it depends very much on what you offer. As I said, uh, screens, uh, a touch screen are just boring now. Uh, and so you, as a museum, you should continuously try something different. So my, my uh, suggestion and what we do as, as our work, we tend to hide the technology into some interesting objects. So first of all, the, the, so the people cannot tamper with it. Yesterday, someone was asking me uh, if people were, you know, uh, changing the setting, for example, of the tablets. If you don't see that there is a tablet behind it, you don't try to, 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 to do it, to change it. So design it in such a way that people don't see there is technology that they can tamper with. And that doesn't, if you create in the end, that is a closed system, uh, uh, it doesn't matter if the technology moves, because otherwise in six months or in a year time, imagine that you have bought a lot of tablets. In six months or one year, they will be old. And definitely the quality of the representation is going to be poorer than what was six months ago. So if you want to design for the future, then you have to be a, a little bit clever. People react incredibly well when they are surprised. So again, try to th think about something that is unexpected. Touch, as I said, touch is incredibly powerful. So if you give an object to people to carry uh, through the exhibition, use this object to activate content, they really build a relationship. They, they, they feel that uh, they, can, uh, they can control the exhibition much more than just touching uh, buttons, even though the action then is exactly the same. You know, If I have five different uh, uh, holes uh, and I have an object to put in the holes is exactly the same than pressing a button but the reaction is completely different so there is evidence of what makes uh, visitors engage um, engage more and I think we should try to use all of these these elements um, in, in all the way we can special events uh, something you do on your own yeah, I've talked to, for too much. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all, no problem. And um, Imran, if we come to you, um, obviously a lot of the visualisation stuff was in the first animals exhibition. Do you have any kind of feedback or evaluation from that about how, how audiences engaged? Yeah, uh, we're, you know, that was an important part of the exhibition and something we wanted to try and capture. We're still working through that process to some extent, but we do have qualitative feedback at least. Um, for for not only the Cambrian Diver, which was our sort of digital interactive, but also uh, the 3D, so different 3D content we had there. And, you know, as you'd expect, these things are mentioned very positively. Um, we could tell anecdotally from our time in the exhibition that people were crowding around those parts of the exhibition more than others. So clearly it kind of in, encourages enjoyment and enthusiasm of people in the space. I guess the difficult question to answer is how long lasting that is. 
um, in terms of, you know, does that mean that these people are then going to take away a newfound love of science and go and uh, study it in university or even take it on in school further? And that's the sort of thing that's harder for a museum to track sometimes. Um, and certainly with the exhibition with, with First Animals, which is a temporary exhibition, um, we can't really track whether people are going to come back again and again. But what I can say is that certainly it has enhanced the enjoyment for people there. And I think in particular for younger people, um, we've seen that they've been much more engaged um, with those parts of the exhibition. So, so it may be that it's an approach that allows you to at least hook in people um, and then you just have to be very smart about how you communicate the information to them. So, you know, it's not enough to just grab their attention. You then need to teach them something or, or help them learn something. Um, so I think that that's always has to be kind of kept in mind. You need to provide that context, that interpretation alongside the 3D data as well. And that was something we tried to do very much in, in the exhibition. Fab. And Thomas, do you do much evaluation at Sketch Fab? Uh, yeah, we keep an eye on uh, how many people are looking at 3D models on Sketchfab, obviously, and, and where they're looking uh, at them. I mentioned in my presentation that um, the majority of views come from embeds. Uh, so the 3D models hosted on Sketchfab uh, on uh, other pages on the internet. Um, and that makes sense because it's exactly what Imran's saying. There, there's the context around, maybe it's a, a news article, maybe it's embedded in a museum collection uh, page. Um, we uh, see, you know, the flip side, we see more and more uh, creators and publishers joining Sketchfab. Um, and so if more people are producing 3D content and pushing that 3D content, I think that's a good sign for the development of the audience, which from my perspective over the last five years, um, I've been working in this area, um, is, is specifically for cultural heritage, is um, growing, it's becoming uh, far more normal. The question isn't kind of what what the heck is 3D and AR and VR. It's what what do I get from this? What do I learn from this? Um, how do I enjoy it? Um, so it's some interesting things we see kind of um, session times um, for 3D models uh, in the kind of the low minutes. I think on average, people are looking at uh, a 3D model uh, probably longer than a 2D image. I would expect of a of the same thing. Um, we also see that. Uh, um, sessions in VR can last longer up to kind of the 20 minutes uh, mark. So people who have a device that they can engage with this 3D content in a, in a uh, different way um, tend to uh, behave differently. Um, and uh, I think, you know, as we get more data on uh, viewing in AR, I think that that should kind of start showing uh, similar trends or differences uh, to normal interactions but um yeah i think it's 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 not going to be where well, it isn't novel like i say anymore i think uh, 3d vr ar there there are things that exist that people know about um and uh, the audience will be specific to whatever you're trying to do not just like there's not like necessarily an audience for just 3d i just want to see everything in 3d it's you know i want to to see some uh, cultural content or a new pair of shoes in 3D. <laughs> that's my that's my two. <laughs> you, you <still. laughs> no, that is a fab point. And um, so picking up on that, um, a lovely question from our conference organizer, Paul, and, and he asks, what do you think a museum experience will look like in 10 years time? And um, so we'll go with Imran first. Well, hopefully we'll be, we'll all be still allowed to visit them in 10 years time. Uh, but I think the physical space is, is really important, right? I mean, we've spoken and we will we'll continue to speak about digital things. But if you think about a museum, the, uh, the act of going to a museum is such an important part of the experience, right? Is people want a day out. They want to go somewhere um, away from home. They want to go and see things in person. So I think that whatever happens, that has to be crucial to the museum experience. There has to be a physical space whereby one can go to look at specimens and learn about them. Um, so I think that's that's the number one point. But I think actually Daniela's point about kind of being creative and thinking about new ways of doing things is important as well. And, you know, we can obviously put a bunch of screens up and show videos of things, but it's sort of old hat already, right? So it's maybe better rather than trying to do too much, you know, try to have 
a digital screen every few meters do a smaller number of things well and maybe that means we have to replace them every few years um but it's better i think to do that sort of thing rather than to just make the entire space full of screens and increasingly digital so so that would be sort of what i would say is that to focus more on these kind of innovative applications which can often come from collaborations with people outside of the museum or in the cultural heritage sector um, and keep pushing those forwards and don't be afraid to change them you know we might always think oh well i spent a year on that thing so i have to keep it up for like five years now but part of the process is adapting and changing and realizing when things have had their day so so yeah i can't really predict then based on that description what museum experience will be like because i think it'll be constantly changing and i think that what we think is innovative now will clearly not be innovative in 10 years time so that that's that's the thing right we can't put stuff in a museum now and think well that'll be there for the next 20 years we have to sort of change our our thinking i think you know we'll we'll put this in maybe we're going to focus a lot of time and effort on it but it might not be there forever so we just have to be adaptable as well as creative and daniela do you have anything to add to that you're on mute daniela <laughs> yeah there we go we use ourselves. So <laughs> <laughs> now, what I was saying is that what I would like to uh, to think, you know, five, ten years time. Uh, yes, the the the, the visit, uh, Richard. But I think something that I really hope would happen in 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 the future is to have uh, the museum and the, the digital technology, the companies working. In a better way today, together, because, for example, I, I think the technology is not exploited in the museum as it should be. You know, you could have, you could continuously create new content and be delivered with the same hardware, for example. But at the moment, when you create an exhibition, that's it. That's the end of it. While instead, you know, you upload your your your, your mobile phone, everything on your computer is an automatic upload. So why not having the same? for digital content available in the exhibition so that every you are invited to come back and that is actually not done and it's part of the of the business model of museum at the moment there is a tendering and the tendering finishes there instead of establishing a more exploratory um, uh, relationship you know you can continuously do for the thing you can create a a setting by which the museum can add more content independently so there isn't the need to have a uh, someone else to do the work for you so you become curate the museum becomes a curator of uh, their own content proposed uh, to a certain position so i think that there could be interesting things to to do and taking the museum also outside of the uh, of the museum itself they could become media producer that at the moment they are not uh, you know there are the cha history channels or other thing why not a museum channel I, I have some of course i'm biased because i go to museum i really love it but the, some of the most exciting conversation you have when you have someone is passionate someone working in the museum that is passionate about something and they can create amazing story just about a single objects so that could be something that the, the museum can take out and continue you know, increase the connection it's always the same story increase the connection with the visitors that are interested in something so maybe in five ten years time instead of the visitors going in uh, there could be something coming out of the museum and uh, the other thing i would like to see uh, more variety uh, there is you know the conversation with museum is very often that the type of visitors are always the same how we can have people that don't engage with museum or don't engage with a topic try to uh, break the barriers that they feel are there we know the museum is for everyone but if you don't feel that is for you you even don't pass the threshold so i really hope that in the future will be more you know a museum is literally for everyone Fab and Thomas, how anything to add on the terms of the ongoing tendering relationship between industry and museums from your perspective? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, just as I was listening there, I think that the things that were going through my head with the, with the, the ideas of community, 
lead museum work um you know not necessarily tied to any physical space um and uh, outsider museums or new museums i think are very fascinating so um, i threw a link to museum in a box um in the chat a while ago um the museum of british um colonialism is a nice example as well um the approach um the, the museum process you know wh whatever that exactly means um from a, a, a more recent um uh, perspective and uh, tactic um to older institutions not to say that either is better or worse um but that's what i, I i'm excited about people making their own collections and uh, telling stories that aren't kind of necessarily matched to an existing collection i think that's that's super exciting um i was also on sketchfab um uh i was looking through some collections that i've uh, created i have a collection of megalodon teeth um from different um organizations there's a uh, one scan from the Lapworth Museum of Geology. There's one scan from the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, there's another from uh, New York. Um, this idea of uh, collections mingling across institutions, um, I think, is quite powerful. Um, and I think that might happen as well. I mean, maybe in 10 years' time, people will be looking at the recording of this session. That will be the kind of stuff you might be seeing in a, you know, uh, probably not in this session, actually, but just what's happening on, I guess, social media and that's where people are having conversations that's where you can uh tell human history from very public um you know uh daily daily content i think you're muted ellie i'm on mute oh <laughs> i've fallen to my own problems um, and just to pick up on a question we have from alex ball to tom and um, what's your favorite thing on sketchfab at the moment <laughs> I feel I should say it's the scans that Alex and his team post. <laughs> um, Wise my, choice. <laughs> my favorite thing on Sketchfab. Oh, that is that is very tricky. Um, oh. Well, I think it's, it's impossible. Um, there's lots of things that I post on Sketchfab. So I, I'm a big fan of my own work, but I'm not going to say that. But I, I think um, what I like seeing is uh, the, the feed of what people are posting so i follow a lot of museums i follow a lot of 3d scanners so citizen scanners or you know people that are recording the the, the world in 3d um and i think that's that's my favorite thing if i can get out of choosing a particular 3d model um is that that feed of ongoing content that i see every day and and that we as sketch we try and pick out the things that we think are most most interesting uh yeah i'll I'll leave it there. A very diplomatic answer. <laughs> um, right, so another question, and this kind of comes from all of your work um, in terms of like digitization of objects. Um, so how do you feel about the relationship between digital and physical objects? And um, often we see that physical objects are seen as the real, the unique ones, and the digital objects are seen as the kind of copies, the imitations. And, do you think they're the same? Do you think that they should be held in the same regard? Um, I know that some of the fossils only have digital um, kind of representations. We have a baby, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, just kind of exploring um, that kind of thing. So Daniela, shall we start with you? Yes, although I'm going to digress from the direct question uh, because I think you can do something more uh, there is more between the relationship between the physical and the digital than just replicating the object. I'm thinking that we, we keep talking about science because, of course, uh, um, the two uh, the two per people, the other two people in the panel, they are more on a, on a science perspective. But I'm thinking of the work that I've done not long ago with English Heritage for Hadrian Swan. And then when they came to us, they they had the, there is a very this very beautiful small museum of uh, Roman uh, uh, things, stones mostly, and he's the very first uh, uh, the uh, John Clayton discovered uh, he had the, the a part of the Roman wall in his uh, in his own park and then started to discover it and so created this collection and it's a collection of uh, uh, early nineteenth century. So it is in itself a heritage piece. So they cannot change it. 
but for our taste today, you enter and there are rows and rows of stones one next to the other one. So when they came to us, they said, you know, we have this beautiful museum, but people enter, spend a couple of minutes and they go and they don't appreciate what they are looking. Some, some of these are really unique objects and you can read all the Roman culture through, through those objects. So our intervention has been to create a, um, so before you enter in the, in the vestibule, there is a temple of Juno, the uh, goddess, uh, um, the queen of the Roman gods. And she gives to you a, a lamp, a physical, you know, inside there is a raspberry Pi. I can tell you what is inside, but you have this, this lamp with three lights. An interesting accident is that because it's, uh, it's powered by conductive charge, when you hold it in your hands, it is warm. So you have this warm object with three lights and you enter the museum. And in the museum, there are 13 gods, everyone with their function. And the, the relation of the Romans with their gods was very transactional. So if I give an offer to you, God, you will do something for me in return. And there were specialized gods, you know, the, the, the god of Esculapio, the god for, for your health, and there was uh, Minerva, the wise god, Mars for the, the, the war and so on. And when you enter with this lamp, you go and choose three of the gods. And what, which the gods that you choose are going to determine your future in, in Adrian's world. So when you go out and you return your your uh, uh, lamp to Juno, she is going to print print your future. So there is a postcard with your three choices and an indication of what is going to happen to you depending on what you've done. And that to me is, you know, we could have replicated the stones, so just scanning the stone and you take the stone away, but instead it is a different, we use technology to make you look at the physical objects in a very different way. So I'm not saying that is applicable everywhere, but very often you can, you know, think out of the box, think something more creative. People in that case, they, they are there, you know, they are kind of studying what are these uh, these gods? What do they do? And they learn a little bit about the Roman uh, way of living. You know, you can find on Adrian's wall gods that come from the Middle East or, or Spain, because the you know in in uh, the armies of the Romans were moving all around the empire. So you know there is a lot, and you have f some local gods actually. So you know you can read what you have around you uh, through this inter digital intervention but in a completely different way so i would like to try to go to break away from the idea that the digital object the connection between the two is just a, a replication of that that could be a very interesting way to use technology to look at the physical object in a very different way and that might that be does sound great and uh Echoing what Sandy says, it sounds amazing. So if you could put any um, informational links in the chat, that'd be brilliant. And um, just before we go to um, Thomas, who may be a bit distracted, but I'm not sure, and um, we're coming towards the end of the session. So if you have any uh, further questions for our panel, do pop them in the chat, we'll try and get them in. And um, if Thomas is all right to speak, um, we'll go to him. <laughs> Oh, I think you're on mute. Shall we go to Imran first um, and then Thomas can fix his uh, audio and we'll come back. Sure, yeah. Uh, I've, I've got my dog crying at me in the background now because it's her dinner time. So there'll be a number of, uh, of uh, distractions probably. Uh, but I, th I think Daniele made a really good point there about the link between the physical and digital objects. And it's not simply replication. And I think that was in, if I, again, sort of take my own experience, um, that was something that we found with uh, the first animals exhibition in particular, where we have these physical specimens, these fossils, which are, you know, what I would call exceptionally preserved. So they're like very beautiful to look at, I think, and they often have a, a series of uh, very aesthetically pleasing colours. Um, but the fossils themselves can be quite difficult to understand if you're not familiar with them. So you might look at that object. Uh, I could imagine a visitor might look at the object and think it looks nice, but not really understand what it represents. Um, so the, the benefit of what we try to do with the digital models alongside that was to try to kind of transform that 
that object into something slightly different. So it wasn't a replication, it was a kind of transformation. So we were trying to extract, for example, the fossil from the rock surrounding it. Uh, in some cases, replace and restore parts of the fossil or the organism that were missing um, and create something that looks a lot more like a living organism. Um, but of course, if you were to just look at that, digital model that wouldn't give you the correct context to interpret what you're looking at. You wouldn't see that this was based on a fossil. You wouldn't understand what the original fossil looked like. And you wouldn't, I think crucially, you wouldn't get the idea of how the scientists have to put quite a lot of interpretation into understanding, you know, what these things look like in 3D. So clearly, at least in that example, the link between the, the, the physical specimen and the digital one, I think is absolutely integral to the whole process. So if you remove one of those things, um, then you wouldn't really be able to understand properly or interpret properly the other one. Um, and you know that's a fairly niche example I've given for first animals, but I think it applies to a lot of objects as well, where you know you can use that 3D or that digital, so I should say digital um, content, that digital model, that digital surrogate to sort of enrich the physical one, um, and vice versa. You know the physical object can enrich your experience interacting with the digital. So there should be, I think, ideally a kind of two-way communication there. Fab, and do we have Thomas back with us? I don't know, do you? Yeah, or we do, fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, one, one thing I really like about museums is, uh, or are, um, object handling tables. And this is one thing that um, I think is kind of something that's underrated at museums, maybe, or maybe it's not. Um, but seeing things behind a glass case isn't the same as um, I have that. <laughs> the same as, as being able to hold them and have a one-on-one -on -one, um, description from, you know, it, maybe it's um, a volunteer, but somebody who's knowledgeable about that object. Uh, and I, I like that idea of that, that's what you can do with a 3D model. That's what annotations are for on Sketchfab, are, are for kind of a, uh, a, a kind of intimate online moment with something. Um, so I, I do like that. Um, I, I think uh, that's what we were doing with Museum in a Box as well, is how can you take, export, package everything about a museum into something you can send out, which isn't necessarily new. I think um, object handling uh, boxes and loan boxes have been a thing for a long time. Um, but yeah, I think there's loads of fun ways, especially if you can't see how the technology is, is kind of being involved, um, like Daniela was kind of um, mentioning, uh, and how you get them to all link up. There's a nice... Um, uh, example from the State uh, Darwin Museum in Russia. They have some models on Sketchfab of some um, uh, skulls. They 3D printed one, put a Raspberry Pi inside. So as you turn the, the skull in your hand, it turned around the object on a screen. I think there are ways that you can, uh, I, I'm not the first to say it, you know, kind of put other things, ah, um, not put the technology right at the front. And we said this before, you know, you, you, you're trying to do something with an audience. You're trying to achieve something. And that, that's you know, whether technology or 3D or, or anything gets you there is, is for you to, to figure out. Fab. So we've kind of concluded that they shouldn't be in competition with each other, but actually complement and uh, work together to make something really unique. Um, and that we hide the technology as much as we can so we can improve those kind of connections. Um, so penultimate question um, from conference organiser Paul Wilson. Um, so obviously we've all been very positive, but there is the uh, impending doom of a uh, recession and whatnot. So how do you think um, that is going to kind of affect um, all the positive energy that we've had in the discussion this afternoon? Should we start with um, Daniela? Daniela, who is sending the last link. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I filled in all the chat with some info. Uh, that's a, that's a, 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 an interesting question because from one side, I've seen a lot of interest in participating, people wanting to do things, people being at home and, and, and discovering a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, so there is a lot of desire of participation uh, and that could be definitely something we can harvest. So in, in, uh, in tight times, uh, uh, if we have more help from outside, we could do more. Um, 
I've seen that there is, in some situations, there is some um, uh, some organizations are more careful in accepting the the volunteers, for example. Volunteers is, is an enormous resource that, for for, uh, for heritage in general because you know they could be really experts or they have the, they have the time, they have the interest to do work that generally cannot be done. But in some organization, there is a real caution about the, you know, what they could offer and not sometimes wanting to, uh, to, um, to check continuously what is done. So not, not uh, really opening up uh, to, to volunteers um, and allow, you know, allow them to, uh, to experiment because Clearly, museums are seen, museum heritage in general, is seen as a, an authoritative uh, uh, voice. And volunteers might bring in a, an amateurish perspective, but I don't, personally, I don't see that negative. It's a, you know, the fact that they see things differently uh, is, not, uh, is not necessarily wrong. It's a different perspective. So, I think it would be nice to try to, to harvest all this energy and positive uh, contribution, the desire to participate. But the museum, I think they need to release a little bit of the controlling power that they generally feel. Uh, because, you know, they, there is this idea that they represent an aspect of societies. So trying a way to include those voices uh, uh, as, uh, as original, as uh, uh, different, probably from what the museum in themselves would put forward, but as an alternative and interesting way to look at. What I've noticed in the past is that if you propose different perspectives, uh, and very often there are historical uh, uh, clashing, you know, we we're talking before about uh, repatriation of objects. There is a huge debate around it. And you can create, imagine one of those objects with very different voices coming in. The colonizer, uh, the colonized, the, the new generation, people that, you know, uh, uh, next generation immigrant here that were from the colonies, how they see rep their own heritage represented or misrepresented in there. So there are all voices that can create a polyphony around these objects. And that I think would be something that we should embrace and go around the tight, <laughs> tight <I> world. <laughs> Anything to add there, Thomas? Um, no, nothing, nothing particular. I think um, the one, the one thing that I was thinking of oh. when you mentioned the kind of economic downturn, you mentioned kind of about how there are ways to make money without betraying your purpose. Sorry, I don't know if I'm speaking loud enough. Um, your your purpose to give away knowledge for free. I think that's that's one thing you might see there. Um, but user generated content, I know that's a kind of thrown around kind of quite a bit, but in a sense, that's what Sketchfab does is it's a platform that um, people publish to and through the work that we do on our social channels, we, we try to highlight things that are happening uh, on our platform. And maybe there's an element of possibility there for uh, cultural organizations to, um, like Daniela is saying, um, be more approachable less authoritative uh, and and inviting of uh, you know another take on uh, whatever their collection or uh, subject matter uh, is. Fab and to Imran. Yeah so I think those are you know really good points there about harnessing the enthusiasm of people to contribute and also looking at ways of commercializing these things and then the only other point I'd add is I think that you know we always need to do as much as we can to demonstrate why these things are worth doing right so we can get together in a conference like this and talk about how pretty all our 3D models are and how great they are but actually what is what is the benefit to society what's the benefit beyond the kind of academic sphere as well. And I think we've all kind of touched upon that. I mean, we've all, we've tried to get at it and something we're interested in, but it's, it's key, I think, to try to capture that information as best we can, you know, it's how do we demonstrate that, that doing this kind of work, that making these kinds of models available or using them in a museum setting is, is helping people learn or is uh, achieving whatever goal we think is important for our organization 
Um, for example, it might be something more about engaging public with research in a particular institution. Um, so I think, you know, we probably need to do more to demonstrate that. And that's where things like uh, well-structured evaluation programs are becoming increasingly important, I think. And I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone of just thinking, oh, well, people love these fossils. They look really nice. And I show them videos and they think it's great. But can we go beyond that, right? Can we show that actually this this is important work? Therefore, it needs to be supported and funded by the organizations that we work for. And yes, there is less money for certain things now, but this is integral to our mission and we need to support it in whatever way we can. So I think that's another part is that we need to show that what we do matters. I think that's a very good point to end on, Imran. Now, before I hand back to Paul to just finish off the conference, um, I'm going to ask you a bit of a quick fire question each um, as a bit of a lighthearted end. So because um, virtual reality allows us to go anywhere in the world, and that's kind of why it's been introduced um, to museums, um, where would you pick to go? Um, so, Thomas, if we can start with you, where's your ultimate virtual reality experience to? Uh can we can we go interdimensional? Yeah, like yeah, you can go wherever. We can go full Doctor Who if you like. I feel like yeah, seeing or you know maybe maybe there's a way to know uh, where those aliens are hiding out there in the universe. I'd, I'd go and say hi. I think. Good and Imran. Well, if I can go back in time, then is that allowed as well? Presumably, of course, that's allowed. Yeah. So yeah. I, there was a particular fossil I worked on in my PhD, which feels like a long time ago now. <laughs> where I still wasn't really sure by the end of my PhD which end was the mouth and which end was the anus. And I'd really like to travel back in time, see that fossil to kind of answer that question once and for all, because it does still keep me up at night. Oh dear, and Daniela? Mine would be much more uh, feasible. Uh, I, I think you've heard that they have uh, um, recreated some of the caves uh, on the Pyrenees uh, uh, with the uh, early early paintings of uh, 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 oh I don't know the name in English anyway yes the painting in the caves from from uh, and and I would like to do that because that has been always in my list my to-do list with one of those and because they they are very strict of a number of people of entering and uh, and to me must you know it must be a fascinating uh, experience to be there and imagine early humans uh, decorating decorating or creating this magical representation of the world so i know it's there somewhere there was a, an exhibition in, in brussels i think but i didn't go so that would be my virtual experience <gasps> Well, what a good um, note to end it on. So thank you very much for all the panellists for joining us today. Thank you to all the audience uh, for joining us this afternoon and on all the other sessions. Um, I'm now going to hand over back to Paul Wilson, the organiser of the conference, just to round us off. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ellie, for hosting that. Excellent job. And again, as Ellie said, I'd like to thank all of our uh, keynote speakers for coming back for this final panel discussion. Good job, was an absolutely fascinating discussion. So, um, so yes, hello everyone. Um, I am Paul Wilson, I've kind of been in the background for most, for, for most of it, but um, I've been in the chat the entire time, I've seen everything and it's been really good. So, um, so before we close out the event, I would just like to say a few words. So I guess over the past two days, we've seen a number of exemplary applications of 3D visualization technologies within cultural heritage. We've seen fully immersive 3D VR games in historic contexts, in historic contexts to life teeming in the ancient Cambrian oceans. We've seen the biomechanics of running crocodiles, tinamou and dinosaurs, and uh, applications printing at the front end of engaging with blind and partially sighted audiences. We've learned a lot about a broad variety of different applications of 3D visualization technologies from 3D optical profilometry to X-ray CT scanning in a huge variety of subjects. We've learned about cuneiform tablets, brass printing plates, and all manner of cool technologies that are set to really enable cultural heritage practitioners to really engage with their audience in new and novel ways. And also how methods from other sectors, like video games and high fidelity props through the, form of, through the medium of 3D printing, uh, really have the power to transform how uh, we uh, present our, our traditional narratives and, I guess, ideas within academia 
uh, to our audiences of both new and old over the next few decades. Uh, we've just had an exciting discussion on how 3D visualization is going to change the landscape of um, how 3D technologies are applied within cultural heritage and how well uh, everyone's favorite global pandemic is going to impact how we bring content to our audiences right now, but also how that will impact cultural heritage practice in a world of a dwindling cultural heritage budget and increasing pressure to reach a wider global audience. I sincerely hope that you've all enjoyed the event and have managed to get some good information, some maybe some new contents to collaborate with us. I've, I've seen a few of those in the chat, that's for sure. And uh, if nothing else, have had a good time chilling through the past two afternoons with us. Um, I have a few points before we close. Um, first of all, um, the subject of the uh, the talks being recorded has come up uh, a few times over the past few days. Um, I've liaised with Jack, our man behind the scenes, who, who has confirmed that all the talks have in fact been recorded. Um, I will be uh, in contact with the speakers individually to see whether or not you want your talks to be shared. And after that, probably starting next week, um, we will share the links to probably host it on the Oxford University Museum, Museum of Natural History's uh, YouTube channel, where they will all be, or at the speaker's request on uh, their own platforms, whichever platforms they so desire. Uh, so that's brilliant, then we'll be in touch with that. And in terms of thanks uh, for the event, uh, there are a few key figures I would like to thank. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank our, our grand list of speakers. So thank you to Daniela, Alexandra, Daniel, Fabio, Imran, John, Kate, Andy, Thomas, Stephen, Drew, and Richard for lending their experiences, expertise, and ideas to the event. Uh, all of the talks were absolutely fascinating, and I hope everyone enjoyed listening to uh, the, the, the facts and expertise that they were able to share over the event. Um, I would like to, again, um, extra props for Daniela, Imran, and Thomas for sharing their thoughts in our panel session. It was a really, really, really interesting discussion. Um, next, I would like to thank our chairs for each of the sessions, uh, starting with uh, obviously Paul Smith for our 3D visualization in natural sciences, uh, Professor Mark Williams for our 3D uh, visualization in the industry, and finally uh, Ellie King uh, for managing our panel discussion. Um, everything went butter smooth, and uh, it's been it's been a blast. Thank you very much. Um, we also, I guess, uh, the biggest thanks must go to our uh, man behind the screen, Jack Matthews, uh, for managing the platform and wrangling everyone to exactly where they needed to be at the right time. It's a gargantuan task organizing all of these speakers and uh, presentations and videos, and your ability to deal with my late night frantic messages was much appreciated, in addition to the technical difficulties that we've had over the course. So thank you very much, Jack. It's been, it's been brilliant. Um, Again, I would like to thank our sponsors and our funders. So uh, the Oxford University Museum of Natural History has been very kind. Um, obviously, had we had the physical event, we would have been uh, in their uh, lovely institution for this event. But alas, given the pandemic, that was not possible. But in terms of providing a lovely backdrop to the event, we've had uh, lovely images from all around the museum. Now, that's been absolutely beautiful and perfect. And I'd also like to thank uh, staff behind the scenes, uh, Laura Ashby, uh, Scott Billings and Rosanna Hayes for their invaluable assistance in organizing and advertising the event. Um, in terms of funding, I would like to thank the institution, the Institute of Advanced Study, or IAS, of the University of Warwick, and their accolade and IAS award schemes for providing the funding for getting this idea off the ground, which was definitely worth it. Finally, I would like to thank you, the audience, for coming along and listening. I hope you've gotten something out of it. And while, unfortunately, we couldn't have that drinks reception, we can at least share a digital beverage, if nothing else. And with that, I would like to bring 3D Viz Symposium of, on 3D Visualization in Cultural Heritage to a close. I hope you've had all had a good time, and I look forward to seeing you all again someday. Thank you very much. And thanks to you, Paul, <laughs> for organizing the meeting. It was very interesting. Yes, for me as well. Thank you. Thank you and all the you know, speakers and for the questions.